Immigration and Customs Enforcement is running a massive domestic surveillance operation, the scale of which we're only just now beginning to understand. Georgetown University's Center on Privacy and Technology released a report this week detailing how ICE has access to the personal information of nearly every single American, and it's stored in an easily searchable database. The information includes driver's license details of about 75% of Americans. ICE also uses facial recognition technology to search through the driver's license photos of about a third of all U.S. adults. The agency is using the driver's license data to track the movements of cars in cities that are home to about 75% of the population. And also, ICE collected utility records of roughly three quarters of the country, which can be used to locate individuals if necessary. Now, some of this we already knew about. Back in December, Yahoo News revealed that a CBP leak investigation carried out by a secretive unit of the agency used the country's most sensitive databases to investigate the finances, travel, and personal connections of journalists, congressional members, and staff, and other Americans not suspected of any crime. But Georgetown's findings show just how far the surveillance goes. The report states, quote, By reaching into the digital records of state and local governments and buying databases with billions of data points from private companies, ICE has created a surveillance infrastructure that enables it to pull detailed dossiers on nearly anyone, seemingly at any time. And it does this with virtually no legal or congressional oversight. And the agency operates well beyond its scope, which is already bad enough, targeting and deporting immigrants. The report adds, quote, in its efforts to arrest and deport, ICE has, without any judicial, legislative, or public oversight, reached into data sets containing personal information about the vast majority of people living in the U.S. whose records can end up in the hands of immigration enforcement simply because they apply for a driver's license, drive on the roads, or sign up with their local utilities to get access to heat, water, and electricity. You know, ICE as an agency is not even 20 years old. It was constructed alongside the Department of Homeland Security out of the paranoia of 9-11. And there would be absolutely no shame at all if we as a country realized, with proper hindsight now, that ICE is a rogue agency that should have never been created in the first place. And it should be shuttered today. Although that's going to be a bit tougher. Now that the agency has a surveillance database that would make J. Edgar Hoover cream in his pants. Sorry for the visualization this early in the morning. The world's most popular cryptocurrency is turning into a disaster for many investors. Data from the outlet Glassnode, which tracks crypto markets, shows that 40% of Bitcoin investors are now underwater. Now in the red which is what you'd expect when the price of Bitcoin has dropped by half in about seven months. And obviously that number is much higher when you factor in only the people who bought in recently, lured into investing by the endless streams of crypto ads that we're exposed to every day now. The real interesting part of the data is there appears to be panic selling going on, which runs counter to the main crypto ethos of hodling or holding onto crypto investments no matter the conditions of the market. Glassnode documented a number of transactions in which investors paid higher fees in order to sell more urgently. It reported that the total value of all on-chain transaction fees paid reached 3.07 Bitcoin over the last week, which is the largest ever recorded. Some Bitcoin enthusiasts will now urge others to buy the dip, but it's not entirely clear if the digital coin has hit bottom given all the headwinds that still exist in the industry, from increasing regulations to just general economic forces that are tanking all markets right now giant flashing red warning sign for crypto traders should be the situation over at Terra Stablecoin. Stablecoins are supposed to be safer forms of digital currency because they're pegged to actual real-world assets like the U.S. dollar, as in 100 Terra USDs, also known as USTs, should cost $100. And when you cash out 100 USTs, you should get $100. Stablecoins help facilitate crypto transactions as investors convert their dollars into stablecoins and then use those coins to purchase other crypto assets. In theory, it works. 
In practice, ensuring that stable coins are actually pegged to the US dollar is very difficult. This week, the value of Terra collapsed more than 50% and is now worth about 50 cents for every dollar. Meaning, if you bought $100 worth of USTs a few weeks ago and tried to cash them in today, you'd only get 50 bucks back. Not great. Meanwhile, the biggest cryptocurrency exchange in the US, Coinbase, continues its implosion. It forecasted a drop in trading volume, leading to a massive sell-off in shares at the company. Since it debuted last year, Coinbase has seen its value slashed by more than 70%. Perhaps a time for crypto investors around the world to ask themselves, is this good? I don't think it's good. Look, I'm not going to say that a bunch of unionized House offices and committees will fix Congress, but it sure as hell can't hurt. Lawmakers in the House passed a resolution allowing their staffers to form unions and collectively bargain without fear of retaliation. The measure amends a law from the 1990s by extending labor protections to congressional staff, which total nearly 10,000. What's great here is the Senate doesn't need to be involved at all. It can't be killed or filibustered by the upper chamber. The legislative work on this matter is done, and it's now up to the workers themselves to secure enough support for a union in their individual offices or committees. It would be nice for the Senate to get involved and extend bargaining rights to its staffers. Senator Sherrod Brown introduced a resolution to do it, but it can't pass a filibuster. Tuesday night's successful vote is a massive W for the upstart Congressional Workers Union, which only formally launched its efforts back in February. Now begins the hard part, getting the union recognized wherever staffers want one, and then securing a contract. The CWU cited a number of reasons why a union is necessary for workers on Capitol Hill. Low pay and benefits, a lack of overtime, paid leave and COVID safety policies, insufficient protections from violence on the job, high turnover, and pervasive sexual harassment and racist, religious, and sexist discrimination. Stories of staff getting mistreated by their bosses are often open secrets around Washington that sometimes break into the press. We all remember the tales about Senator Amy Klobuchar and the hair comb, or the binder, or the leg shaving. <sighs> Last year, the House office with the highest staff turnover was Rep. Victoria Spartz's. Workers left three and a half times more often than the average office on the Hill. And more than a half dozen former staffers described to Politico exactly why that is. Quote, Rep. Spartz frequently yells and curses at aides, belittling her staff's intelligence and berating them in front of others, members, constituents, and even with reporters in close proximity. On more than one occasion, three former staffers said Spartz likened her aides' writing skills to those of elementary school students, and proclaimed that her children were more talented than her staff. Her workplace is so toxic that even House leadership intervened. It was reported that GOP brass met with her on at least two occasions since last year to discuss, quote, her performance as an employer. When you've got even Kevin McCarthy telling you you're a bad boss, you've really screwed up. Sparts did not vote for the resolution allowing her staff to negotiate better working conditions. In fact, not a single Republican did. It was a strictly party line vote, so every Republican will have to go back to their office and explain to their staffers why they shouldn't have First Amendment rights to organize. But their staffers are little weirdos too, so they'll probably like it. Hey, thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our new videos. Also, if you want to see Means Morning News in its complete form, not just the clips we post here, head on over to Means TV and get access to all our new episodes and our entire backlog, plus tons of other great movies and original TV shows.